So they had some sites with too much inventory, other sites because they were hoarding in the middle of the pandemic to make sure they had enough, and then other sites who weren't, and they were like running out still. And so the ones who did the you know informal cross collaboration and could really actually work that network to say, hey, call their friend at another site, they were taking care of. The other ones who just didn't have that existing network and relationships when the technology failed them, right, or the uh, solution they had innovated, they experienced, unfortunately, more of the pain. Without supplies, there's no surgery. Without products, there's no patient care. Welcome to Power Supply, the healthcare supply chain podcast focused on helping you navigate the intricacies of logistics, purchasing, contracting, and supplier relationships. Each episode, we speak with healthcare executives, supply chain leaders, and innovative entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the loading dock to strategic sourcing, from buyers to the C-suite, and across the enterprise, we tackle the real-life issues impacting the healthcare supply chain. Whether you're tuning in for conversation or inspiration, we're glad you're here. You're just in time to hear it from the source and stock up on insight. So sit back and plug into Power Supply. On this episode of Power Supply, we are speaking with Tom Coleman, Managing Director, and Michelle Calacion, Senior Manager, Enterprise Performance of Supply Chain Operations. They're with Deloitte Consulting, and we got a tip from some loyal listeners that they did a great job presenting at the Arm Annual Conference on the Frontline's perspective on achieving supply chain resilience. Obviously, resiliency is a big buzzword, but I love the fact that they did some research that they're going to tell us all about today that really gave us a frontline perspective, not just a high-level perspective, Hayes. Come on. You got to enjoy this. It's really, really good. Obviously, they did get uh, a lot of kudos from their uh, presentation, but they did a great job. And if you stick around, you're going to learn what a Georgetown Hoya is. So come on and join. (laughs) We'll be right back with Michelle and Tom. I'm Hayes Walder. This is Gary Skinner. And I'm Justin Poulin. From the studios of Healthcare HQ, you're listening to Power Supply. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Tom Coleman, Managing Director, and Michelle Calacion, Senior Manager of Enterprise Performance and Supply Chain Operations at Deloitte Consulting. And I'm just going to preface this whole conversation today by saying that we've got a small team of supply chain leaders across the country that are part of the Power Supply Advisory Group, and they help us identify great guests to have on the show. Now, while I was at the ARM annual conference this year, I was recording a lot of podcasts. I didn't get to go see many presentations, but the reason we are speaking with Tom and Michelle today is because Many of our members of the advisory group brought up their presentation on supply chain resilience as one of the ones that they really enjoyed at the conference and thought that the two of you would make an excellent guest on the podcast. So I want to introduce you both. Michelle, why don't we start with you and just have a, you know, tell us about your career, how you find yourself at Deloitte today, and, you know, maybe a fun fact about supply chain, you know, since 2020. A fun fact about supply chain. Well, I'll think about that one. Well, appreciate you having me on the podcast today. Um, Michelle Clausion, as you mentioned, I have been uh, really at the intersection of supply chain and healthcare for the past 13, 14 years. The past really three, four years obviously have been focused primarily on risk and resiliency. And one of the uh, hats I wear today at the firm is uh, one of the leaders of our supplier risk mitigation program. It's a program we have for commercial clients in healthcare, a consortium of of sorts that are really thinking about kind of the, the leading edge attributes of deploying resiliency within supply chain. So great to be on the podcast today and, and look forward to the conversation. And a a fun fact, maybe not so fun, I read recently that back orders and disruptions are still 
six to eight X what they were in 2019. So while everyone thought we would be kind of back, you know, kind of post COVID, you know, in this hangover period, kind of back to a, a normal state, I think we are seeing things are anything but normal. So not so fun fact. <laughs> yeah, we but. worked so hard <laughs> to standardize and get that item master whittled down. And now here we are looking at alternative strategies. Yeah, no doubt. Perpetual disruption. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the new normal. Perpetual. We're nothing if exactly. not flexible at this point. Tom, why don't you tell us about your background? Maybe even give us the story about how you put this presentation together with Michelle Forearm. Like, did somebody ask you to do it? What's the What's the full story behind it? Yeah, we can do that first. I'll do an introduction. Tom Coleman. So I have been at Deloitte for two and a half years, but I've always been a consultant. That's the only job I've ever had since college. So 20 plus years in that. Always focused on the federal government, but my fun fact is not always supply chain. I actually got involved in supply chain when at my former employer, I became the practice leader for the Internet of Things and supply chain management and knew zero about supply chain management. <laughs> but they figured I was surrounded with experts who could help me and I was a good leader, you know, and I could, you know, ask the right questions, calling BS on people when needed and, you know, just really pro- probing around and seeing where we could go. And it went really well. So at Deloitte, I focus mainly on federal health clients. So that's the counterweight to Michelle. She's on the commercial healthcare side. I'm mainly on the federal government healthcare focused on supply chain and really focused on how can we improve operations is the most part, whether that's tactical or strategic. To answer your question about how this all got started is Michelle and I and others really started, I guess, two years ago, starting to research on, you know, resiliency and supply chain for health, I'm sorry, resiliency and health supply chain specifically. And what was that? What were some of the, you know, things we were looking to find? We actually started the research thinking that we we're going to find a silver bullet or at least some common themes on technologies that had really helped to like achieve supply chain resiliencies. And what we found out is like, yeah, no, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> it's really all blocking and tackling. It's the pain points. It's, like good, you know, getting through, like, do you understand what you are actually trying to solve? Because lots of times we have seen, and we found many of these cases, we can talk about some of them, where people applied a technology solution because they thought they knew what was wrong, but they really hadn't dug down to what was the root cause. So their solution was either somewhat effective or not really effective at all, because they didn't actually fix what they needed to fix. So we've done research talking to public and private sector entities, healthcare and non-healthcare supply chain leaders to try to, because healthcare obviously and supply chain can learn from other industries. It's not a perfect example by any means. And getting some questions for them, we did research more broadly, as I mentioned, on healthcare resiliency. And then more recently, we did it on the frontline perspective, actually going and talking to some frontline personnel and supply chain, because obviously the headquarters perspective, however you want to call it, or central office, right? you know, driving what they think supply chain resiliency is, is very different than the person who's in the loading dock or in the storeroom trying to make sure that the necessary products are there. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's really the title of the episode, right? Is getting that frontline perspective. And I know we have a lot of leaders that listen, you know, to this podcast, but we've also tried to curate both in videos and some of the topics content that's a little bit more, you know, relevant for all different levels. And so I like how you looked at that from a big picture, but then drilled that down. So I'm, I'm excited to dive into that, you know, a little bit more today. Hayes, I didn't, I don't know if you had something. Well, I was going to ask a question totally off topic because you asked her a fun fact about supply chain. I was just going to ask Tom, what is a Georgetown Hoya? What is a Hoya? Can you, can you describe that in detail? Uh, yeah, no one really knows for sure. It's, uh, you know, it means the what they think, you know, what rocks Hoya Saxa. Um, mascot is a bulldog. Um, there is a real bulldog. It does rotate over time as they, you know, have to go into retirement. But yeah, that's about as best we're going to get, Hayes. I do know, time. I think my understanding is, I think Georgetown was one of the very first schools anywhere to have a live mascot. I do think that's a fact. Don't hold me to it, but I think that's right. We didn't have a live mascot always. So when I was there from 1997 to 2001, it was during that period, I want to say like around 2000 when we got the live mascot back again. Um, so Okay. Well, that's interesting. Well, again, uh, fun facts about supply chain and uh, has nothing to do with well, it. Hold on. You haven't divulged. What's your mascot, Hayes? 
Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a Tennessee Vol, so we all know it's a blue tick town, right? Yes. That you know, it's smoky, and so yeah, that's who that or Dolly Parton. It depends. Um, you know, <laughs> she, she, she plays a vital role in our in our school dynamic for sure. Well, you were I mean, a volunteer guess, in college, and you're a volunteer here on the Power Supply podcast as well. <laughs> oh no, I get paid millions here, um, Michelle. Uh, so you, you, I think you went to Cornell, and y'all were the Big Red. Is that correct? Well, the Big Red. It's a, it's a bear, and th- thankfully not a live mascot. That that <laughs> wouldn't work very well. All right. We won't go down this path any longer, but I just like to find out a little bit about Ahoya. So that was very helpful. Thanks so much, both of y'all. Well, let's talk about the presentation at ARM because, Tom, I think you were kind of laying that foundation, you know, for the research. Was the presentation really about presenting the research and specifically your work with the front line or how, you know, how did you structure that conversation or or how you were guiding the, that discussion? Because it sounded very interactive to me from what I heard from the people that were in attendance. So definitely we use the research as the foundation and, you know, shared some of those facts and data that we got from the research, but it was not presenting just the research. We asked the audience is the right word to say there, right? A lot of them were from the field at the Veterans Affairs Administration. There's a large VA contingent at the conference, but other hospital systems too, and got their feedback. So when we said something and we said, hey, this is what we found from the people we talked, did this resonate with you? And then that just led to a very interactive discussion going off topic, asking us questions throughout. We are not one, Michelle and I, to wait to the end to say if you have a thought process. And then we also added our personal experiences, you know, given that we deal with a wide range of clients to there. But Michelle, what else did you think about the presentation? Yeah, certainly very discussion focused. I think we had some good conversation on where on the priority set is risk and resiliency now that we are in this kind of post COVID period. And is it still in the top one, two, three, or, you know, do we see it, you know, moving down the priority set? And, you know, and and where do we see kind of investments getting shunted now and, you know, kind of a a perspective on, um, you know, in the near term and long term. So, you know, a a variety of different perspectives in the room. But I I think consistently we heard a a, a emphasis and focus on risk and resiliency is here to stay. So that's that. I mean, first of all, let me say, I want to applaud you. Just, I, th- I think the kind of the way you came about kind of the surveying, if you will, is interesting. Generally speaking, I think we, a lot of times we see people, they call them the quote, the corporate office and or the, you know, the, the decision makers, if you will. And it doesn't really get down to the clinical, the care teams, the, you know, the people doing the care. And so what maybe things did you find that, that surprised you in that? Or was there discrepancy between what, the, the caregivers are saying as compared to the the folks in the office, if you will, was there any discrepancy there? Was it all kind of the same? Just kind of anything you could add to that? So one thing I thought was interesting is the more I've dug into this again, so I generally focus with government clients, but this research has exposed me more to commercial healthcare. The more similarities there are between them, like there are definitely differences in some cases where the government some larger systems or maybe a little not as advanced as they would think, but actually not like there's cases where the government and certain government clients are well ahead of some of commercial healthcare systems and other cases are not. But the frontline perspective I think is interesting is when you talk to those people, they all have a passion. They want to do their job. They want to make sure that they're getting the medical system working and that they are not hindering, uh, you know, the ability for patients to get the care they need. So you see that when you talk to the people And then there's a lot of frustration, I would say, in the front line, too. Somewhat is for leadership, not understanding why they make certain decisions and where they go that. And a lot of it is, given what we all do in supply chain, with the partners that they have to deal with. And they're not giving them what they want or they don't understand why they're not getting what they want. So the communication or transparency isn't there. And as a frontline person, they're on the hook to solve it, right? So if something's not coming on a truck that should be coming on a truck, It's great if someone told them in central office or back office, right, you know, why, but if they're not getting it and they don't know, and in particular that they have to then course correct that day, whether that is, you know, getting it from another hospital, just, you know, looking in a different storeroom within the existing hospital, those are the problems they're going to solve. So yes, they care and they want to improve and see the big picture, but they're also very narrowly focused on what they have to do today. Yeah. And and Tom, to amplify one thing that you mentioned 
that I think was, you know, a bit surprising is just really the, the foundation of communication that is critical in, in all of this. In implementing resiliency requires risk to be an enterprise focus, not a supply chain focus, not a executive team focus or a frontline focus. It takes coordination, communication, and infrastructure really that connects the dots, you know, up and down the organization. And, you know, I think that's one thing that, you know, has evolved over time. And now as we think, you know, out of crisis mode and and, and hand-to-hand combat mode into more of a sustainable model is just, you know, how do we best uh, implement that infrastructure and communication channel such that when, you know, something pings on the radar, that the channels are built to share the information to react jointly versus, you know, in silos or, you know, in, in an uh, uncoordinated way. So I think that's one of the key things that's really resounded in, in all the conversations that we've had so far. You know, I, I think about a lot of that movement towards emergency preparedness, which is really, you know, just a function of risk management and vulnerabilities. And a lot of times when this was being discussed, I'd say heavily, you know, eight to 10 years ago in a lot of the, like my local arm chapter, we did several presentations. A lot of it had to do with, you know, impacts of hurricanes and things like that, that had shut down some pharmaceutical manufacturing, but also emergencies locally, such as flooding and thinking about how do we coordinate resources between health systems? And it's interesting what you just said there, Michelle, because a lot of times we can barely coordinate between departments within the healthcare organization, let alone really get those tentacles out into the community. And I think we had a really great interview about risk management with Mike. Schiller from ARM and a colleague that he had been working with. And I think we've all talked about how the C-level has paid more attention from a financial perspective to supply chain, but I feel like risk is getting a lot more involved too. And so, you know, one thing that Tom and I talked about that is kind of a constant theme on the show is, you know, how long will supply chain be able to hold that sea level attention, right? And are we really in a window where we've got to make hay while the sun is shining? But it is different because I don't feel like risk has been involved before. And I wonder if that's kind of the, the wedge that sort of keeps supply chain at that level with this amount of attention, you know, for the future. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? One consideration is just how we define risk. Because I think we have, you know, organizations have segmented risk. And, you know, I think we're seeing much more integration of all the different risk lenses that, you know, need to be evaluated together. So instead of completely segmenting cyber risk from, you know, supply chain risk and business continuity, you know, and, 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 you know, we're seeing more sophistication at that executive level of, you know, having a chief risk officer or, you know, having, you know, kind of centralized responsibility under the the CPO or chief supply chain officer to really integrate all these different facets of risk management. So, you know, I I do see it elevating up to be a C-suite level topic and, and better coordination and more sophistication of, you know, approaching risk and resiliency at an enterprise level, not just from a supply chain perspective or from an individual discrete perspective. It's a coordinated strategy perspective, right? Instead of that siloed, let's solve our problem over here. Instead, you learn how to mobilize all the resources in a coordinated effort instead of everybody kind of solving their little bit and piece and not really knowing how that's all playing out. Tom, you said something about layering technology on, on top of a problem, And thinking that will solve the problem and then it doesn't solve the problem because the problem is foundational. And, you know, we see that all the time. That's not limited to healthcare that lots of organizations do that. And, and a lot of times it comes from a lack of understanding, you know, of how things are actually working. And, And it's that disconnect between the higher level and those front lines, right? So do you want to illuminate kind of your thought there about the foundational aspects and why you can't just layer on a technology and how that really presented itself in your discussions with people doing the day-to-day work? 
Yeah. So a couple things. One, I think holistically from the consulting that I've always only ever been in consulting, you always got to look at people, process and technology together. And like, I've been like 20 years has been ingrained in my head. And it scares me sometimes when either other consultants forget that that you have to look at things holistically because they're just like, no, this will solve it. Like when Michelle talks about communication, if you have all the data together and you show it's all there and they can pull the data, it matters. Well, that will like increase all the transparency you need. Well, it actually won't if the people don't want to use the system for whatever reason, right? So layering in the change management and incentivizing them to use it, because maybe there's a reason why there is an incentive for them not to actually know things so they can claim ignorance or not, you know, like being able to label exactly the pinpointed problem, right? So putting that all important. The example I'll use really quickly is when we were doing our research, three times this came up, which is fascinating to me, three different stories. In the middle of the pandemic, Three different in- entities, two healthcare related, one retail, so not all healthcare, all were experiencing not enough um, supply at their point of use or point of care for a healthcare setting, right? And so all three of these entities decided, you know what we need to do? We need to build another warehouse. We're going to get more inventory into the system. And that is going to, you know, solve our problem so that we can make sure that we have enough inventory, at, you know, at the end point when people need to either buy it or when we need to take care. In all three of those cases, Guess what? They actually didn't get the outcome they were solving because they still had issues where they didn't have inventory when they needed it because their problem was not actually they didn't have enough inventory in the system. They didn't know where their inventory was in the system. So they had some sites with too much inventory, other sites because they were hoarding in the middle of the pandemic to make sure they had enough, and then other sites who weren't. And they were like running out still. And so the ones who did the, you know, informal cross collaboration and could really actually work that network to say, hey, call their friend at another site. They were taken care of. The other ones who just didn't have that existing network and relationships when the technology failed them, right, or the uh, solution they had innovated, they experienced, unfortunately, more of the pain. So it is. How much of that is also a technology failure, though? Like, I get what you're saying, but I almost feel like there are certain people who are just great at networking that are in that leadership role. And then there are other people that are in a leadership role that are still great leaders that aren't necessarily great networkers. And it's sort of like you had this confluence, right, of this skill set that allowed some to thrive in that scenario where others not. And I'm not saying it's not still a foundational thing. I just wonder how much should technology be solving the foundational issue as well? Not just that the organization can't layer a tech on top, but shouldn't the tech focus on that in, in development to some extent? Yeah, actually, the other part I'm going to say to you, Justin, actually, is it's not a leaders, right? If you're solving the end point, the front line, whether they have supply or not, that's not leaders. That's generally individual hospitals, right? Like, in particular, like, take a pick city, Cincinnati, right? You know, like they work across whether it's government, another health system, etc. in their relationships to say, hey, can you give me this and I'll get that from you because they know they have each other's backs because they know each other and they know that they are all in it together, So, yes, I'm sure at a corporate level, those actual hospital systems, they should talk to each other and make sure and like work on it. But it is really that frontline perspective of people to make sure they get. Yes, you should be to the other question about you want to add technology where it's going to actually work, but you're not pointed at the right problem. If you are not like solving what you actually need. So in this case of my example, it wasn't actually adding more inventory in the system, which I appreciate is not a technology problem, but actually the technology problem was not knowing where your inventory was in the system. Like that's a different solution altogether and how you would make the decision to invest in that and move out without actually peeling back. Cause it should have been relatively easy to say, Hey, but like, okay, you're going to add more inventory, but will we know actually where that inventory goes? Right. You know, one of the other, you know, major pain points that I'm seeing present it, you know, present itself after the deployment of technology is just an inundation of information. And it's like, great. Now we have visibility into these risks, but one, you know, everything becomes a fire. And when everything's on fire, you don't even know which are the critical fires to put out. And, uh, you you know, that's a a whole other problem that, you know, you've implemented this technology, you have transparency, you have visibility, you have information, you have data, but now you don't know what to do with it or how to prioritize it is, you know, a whole other 
kind of stage that I've seen, you know, some of my clients who have just tried to flip on technology, you know, be a bit paralyzed. And Michelle, I just want to add one thing to that. And because we've talked about this, it's not even that those clients don't actually have the skills to do it. They just don't have the time. If they're getting inundated with this data, they have a million operational things they are trying to do. So them trying to sort through, because on a lot of these tools, we have one too, right? You know, where you can just send alerts to you and tell you everything you want to know about 3M, right? In particular product category, et cetera. But what do you do with all those alerts? Like, how do you actually rationalize to Michelle's point where you want to prioritize if you don't have the time and or staff? Because we haven't talked about labor shortages here, the shortages on staff to go through all that. But Hayes, you were going to ask a question. Well, I was just going to bring up I, a lot of this is kind of relevant because I just had a conversation with a supply chain exec who's really well known, a large, large system. And he, he asked me a very simple question about uh, I use this texting app through our company. And he was like, how do you do that? And I told him, he goes, I don't have the ability at this massive $5 billion IDN to send a text from me to my different teams in supply chain. He says, I don't have the ability to do that. And he goes, what do you use? And I was like, how simple is that? I mean, and ultimately it came down to lack of resources. No one, there's not enough people in the day and, you know, the time of the day, people to do it, to do something as simple as set this up in distribution system, you know, so that they could send someone to everybody in the dock, everybody in the warehouse, everybody on the front line, whatever it is. They don't have the ability, and I'm sure, and that's a big system. I'm sure that there's many others listening to this going, they would beg just to have someone else to help them do some of that. So back to our point, I mean, it's, I think so many people are resource challenged, and it makes it very, very difficult to do some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, the technology's available, but if you don't have the time and the and the resources, the, the IT staff, whatever, to implement it, it's, uh, you know, you're back to kind of where we started. So anyway, I'll just throw that out there. I think you're spot on. I want to ask a question about that in the context of resiliency too. You know, I feel like it's one of those things where we have to build the structures for resiliency before we need them. And in so many cases, and obviously the pandemic was an example of that. And some of that was just strategy wasn't aligned with what was going to happen, right? Like we didn't know we were going to have this kind of supply disruption and availability in the back orders necessarily. But the whole movement of the industry was leading us to a point of really being vulnerable to the exact type of disruption that occurred. But I also feel like a lot of what you're talking about in terms of having those processes is now with the with the time and manpower shortage, it's like even harder to build the resiliency because it does take a different level of strategic involvement. I mean, you're talking about adding analytics to supply chain. You know, that's not a, hey, that guy over there or that lady over there, we can just move them into this role and have them do the analytics. And because they're bright, we're going to solve our problem. To your point with the time demands, we're talking about trying to increase the workforce at a time that the availability of the workforce is also down. And we need that to be able to leverage the technology properly to be able to suffer the shortage itself. So I kind of feel like we're beyond a game of chicken. We're in a catch-22 at this point. Like, how do you dig out of this? What When you talk to your clients, how do you advise them to take you know, the, the old saying of how do you move an iceberg, one ice cube at a time, right? Like, how do you advise them to start making the kind of improvement? Because I feel like in many cases, especially based on size of organization, this could be a five to 10 year plan. Hopefully we'll have that kind of luxury <laughs> in terms of that amount of time, but you just never know. Yeah, I agree with the uh, um, one ice cube at a, at a time. Um, <laughs> I've never heard that, certainly... by the way. That's a new one to me. I thought it was something about eating an elephant. Yeah. I thought it was eating an elephant one by a time, but the yeah. whole oh, ice cube, I thought, you can I, use it. Uh, anyway, you can I'm going to let it go. Hayes. I like it. Think it through, Hayes. Yeah, You'll get it, it right. works for me. I thought yeah. <laughs> an iceberg actually floats. So that's what I was thinking. It, it just might move slow, but go ahead. There's a, a couple different considerations, uh, you know, about digging out of the hole. You know, the first one is, uh, you know, embedding more kind of proactive resiliency and having risk be part of the decision making criteria. I think so often we've been, you know, supply chain's been tasked with defining value as as cost. 
and you know organizations that that paradigm shifting and and organizations are now adding you know risk and resiliency as as part of the the value equation and you know as normal course of business and making decisions about you know who you contract with you know how you manage your suppliers embedding those type of you know expectations into the contract and maybe not going sole source and going multi-source, you know, and, and embedding that proactive resiliency. In order to do that effectively, you need more information, you need more data. And so we see clients getting more sophisticated in terms of, you know, understanding the full value chain of their critical supplies and pharmaceuticals and getting more informed when they're at the table with their suppliers to say, what are you doing to embed resiliency into your operations and just making that part of the conversation. You know, I think those are, are two key things, I think, I- incremental to creating the infrastructure internally to make risk and enterprise conversation and price priority that, you know, I think we already touched on a little bit earlier in our discussion. I think I would add, yeah, definitely, and we've talked about it, I think you just said it, Michelle, again, prioritization is key. And you have to put resources to it. If you think that you are going to miraculously solve this just by prioritizing a little bit and, you know, getting a tiger team or something together that's going to, you know, work on this for a little bit and you will have, you know, getting it, you might solve some problems. It might have some incremental improvements. I don't downplay that at all. But if you want to really move the needle, right, you know, and get, you have to prioritize what do you actually really want to fix? Where are those outcomes and do they align with your, the broader mission beyond supply chain so that you can get that executive level commitment? Because if like, especially with the cost pressures, if you're down a path and you're not showing the return, right, you know, and, it, and how it aligns to the broader mission, you're going to be much more likely to lose that funding and or prioritization, right, you know, with it. And you need that year over year because this is not a quick fix, Justin, right? Like it's going to take a couple of years, hopefully not five years or more. But if you can show that, like, I guess I didn't say the speed is part of it. If you can show some incremental improvements quickly or really like an, a product quickly, like, you know, Michelle, we talk about on the risk management side, actually showing how this has helped someone make a better decision or a more informed decision, that's really impactful. And, and everyone can relate to that. If it's something more esoteric that you're going to have, you know, 25% cost savings in five years, well, leadership will then be like, well, I'm sure there's other ways it might be faster for me to get 25% cost savings if I'm only doing cost savings, right, with it. It's just so counterintuitive to for supply chain that's traditionally been the department responsible for cost reduction to go to the C-suite and say, I need an increase in budget. I mean, it's just like not what they do, right? And, and so I, I almost – and I do realize now, too, the C-suite is recognizing – supply chain's role in, in either, you know, facilitating optimal revenue or actually in some cases generating revenue. But that's kind of a new realization. And I'm not sure everybody working in supply chain, even le- leadership is totally like aware of how much the CFOs are paying attention, you know, to that or are willing to where they hadn't been in the past. But I still feel like it's a challenge to go back to those same you know leaders and say hey for me to do what really needs to be done i need you to spend more money it just doesn't even sound right rolling off the lips and so you know i'm assuming that when you're incorporating risk in this conversation around resiliency is that how you get the c level to buy into adding resources to do something that is truly sustainable because that like we hear sustainability and resiliency kind of intertwined as if they're synonymous and they're not the resilient sustainability is something that facilitates resiliency right and so is that how like if you were talking to our audience which you are now but if you were one on one with them and they said how do i make this case for the c suite like is there kind of a package of a way to present that so that they can get those resources successfully I would think about telling the story about how supply chain enables the broader organizational priority and goals. And that is typically well beyond just kind of cost savings, but managing risk, delivering on ESG priorities. I mean, and there's, you know, probably a half dozen others where, you know, if you think about it and you take a step back, 
supply chain is part and parcel of driving those organizational strategies. And so the, the ability to connect the dots on, you know, how does that, you know, how, how do those investments then enable a broader definition of, of value delivery beyond just cost reduction is critical to delivering that story to the executive team. And I think there also is the point, like you got to show a relatively quick return on investment, at least from a pilot or otherwise, because if you're, you're not going to get a large ask approved, right? If you're asking for like, you know, a hundred million dollars <laughs> to do something and you don't have a clear path of showing how you're going to, you know, save 500 million in that example, right? Or something crazy like that. They're not going to prove it. Like you're right. Like they, there's too many other pressures here. So it is prioritization, like showing quick return. And then I think the other part, which is hard for us as supply chain professionals is deciding what you're not going to do. Maybe it is you take it on your skin and you're going to maybe downgrade or do something a little less than you like. So you can invest that. I mean, one of the things that was most shocking to us the last time we did this research is that like, a full almost 75% of like professionals did not have time to invest in the future. It wasn't they didn't have money to invest in the future. They didn't have the time to do so, right? So the only way they're ever going to find the time is by stopping doing something else. Yeah, and, and, and upskilling, upskilling their resources, right? Like we, I like it, what you said about the small return project too. To upscale the resources, you get a little win, show that you're competent, that you have a strategy that works. And then the next thing you know, they're coming to you and saying, what's next? What can you do now? What can you do for me today? And you start to get on a roll and generate some momentum. So maybe you don't get it all at once, but it's the ice cube at a time. Right, Hayes? Oh, yeah. You bring that ice cube back. Uh, Tom, do you have an example of maybe a, a small win that someone has done or either either one of you that that showed that, that you know, some success? Do you have anything that off, off the top of your head that you think someone's kind of done that, you know, go, hey, this is it worked. We did this. And here's the outcome. Anything off the top of your head? I, I mean, some of those just simple stuff like renegotiating certain agreements, like, you know, with people. Like if you had five suppliers and you realize from a resiliency side, you really only need two, especially if five of those suppliers, when you get to the third tier down, all have the same, you know, underlying supplier, like, you know, and that can generate a cost savings by increasing your volumes. It's pretty simple, right? You know, but it does happen. The other one, which we've seen, like actually is an interesting one for me looking holistically is do you rely very heavily on a, you know, distributor or do you take more in-house? Cause there I've seen, a large healthcare systems take differing approaches these days. Some of them are building out their own internal network, building out their own warehouses locally, et cetera, buying more directly from the manufacturer, leveraging their cost savings because they can do it very largely. Other ones are saying, nope, we're not breaking the model. We, you know, use our GPO. We use our distributor. We like it works well for us. This is not an area of expertise. We don't want to invest the resources ourselves to build up that, right? Probably didn't completely answer your question, Hayes. I just went to a different one. But I think that's like a good dichotomy. of There's some of these that there is no right answer. It is also what is the right answer for you and your organization, given your priorities, mission, et cetera. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking through a, a couple different examples of organizations that are becoming much more sophisticated in managing their overstock and the stockpiles from the COVID era. And you know, being very strategic on the, the ramp down of those supplies to try to avoid all the, the write-offs of bad stock, right? You know, especially now that we're a couple of years out and, you know, some organizations are writing off multi-million dollars of expired stocks of, of gloves and gowns that they, you know, stockpiled and are now tossing out, while other organizations have been on top of managing their inventory and, and, kind of reading the, you know, what the next six months would hold and where are we trending and, and making kind of choice decisions on what they procured. So that being one example, another example of better integration between the supply chain team and the pharmacy team and trying to extend the management of risk and resiliencies from a supply perspective and think about how to work with all of the drug shortages that are continuing to come rapid fire, right? So, you know, how could you get the manufacturers at the table, the, the um, GPO, the wholesaler at the table to be much more sophisticated from that perspective as well? All right. So I have one final kind of question and then we'll wrap up. But we started early on kind of talking about how there was a lot of 
condensing, you know, how many suppliers you have and the item master. And then it seems like we're expanding now for that resiliency and, you know, having some, some versatility in terms of our supply mix, you know, in the event of a back order, is that going to keep going for the next three to five years? Like if you were to, to look out, are, are we expanding? Like, are we really expanding um, our supplier base? And if yes, is that going to continue? Are we literally reversing directions? Well, I don't think, it, you know, my perspective, I, you know, I don't think the pendulum is going to continue to swing, you know, at the same momentum that it, that it did over the past couple of years. What I, I think we'll see is a leveling out and not just expanding suppliers and SKUs for the sake of, you know, calling that resiliency. I think organizations are getting much more sophisticated at supplier relationship management as a whole, better collaboration, being more strategic with a prioritized set of suppliers versus any and all, and trying to get those strategic suppliers at the table on, you know, how do we kind of co-invest in risk and resiliency versus making it a, a unilateral strategy of just contract with anybody and everybody and, and call that redundancy and resilience. Michelle, definitely on the supplier relationship management and knowing where you want to like focus that effort, right? Because you don't have time and energy to like have the same relationship with all of your suppliers. Some of them matter far more for whether there really is a limited source, whether they have a larger, you know, impact across your system because you buy so much from them. So you making that decision of where you're going to focus your supplier relationship management efforts in alignment with your goals and objectives of supply chain is hard because that means you're going to not focus on some suppliers, but you do need to be cognizant of that. The other thing I think when you talk about item masters, I think we're getting to a point where people are starting to realize, as I think I mentioned earlier, just because you have five suppliers, it doesn't mean you have any less risk. Of all of those five suppliers go down two layers down and all get the same you know raw material from the same person, you have the same risk whether you have one or five. And so some organizations will say, you know what? I'd rather buy it all from one supplier, get that discount, take that risk because I'm okay with it. Maybe not like loving it, but I'm okay and I've done that risk management analysis for the cost savings. I'll do that trade off. So I think it is more targeted. So I think there will be cases where we will be expanding the item master, but I don't think it will be rampant. And I do think it will be more intentional and thoughtful of like, why are you doing it rather than it's some clinician preference or you just really want to have two of everyone, right? Tom. Michelle, you killed it. You killed it just like they said you would when they told me to reach out to you and invite you on the show. Great job. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it was great. Great to be here. Great conversation. That was Tom Coleman, Managing Director, and Michelle Calacion, Senior Manager, Enterprise Performance of Supply Chain Operations. They're both with Deloitte Consulting great conversation today you know it's interesting sometimes we talk about things like resiliency but you know to really talk about what that looks like on the front lines i love the research approach that they took and how they really gathered those insights because sometimes we do try to throw a band-aid you know on a gaping wound or you know we just put it on the wrong part of the body (laughs) and it doesn't stop the bleeding and i feel like having the time to do those kinds of insights, it's probably elusive for many of the healthcare organizations out there today. So I love that they did that legwork and brought those insights forward. I think, you know, we need more of it. Honestly, we need more because we we need to be, even though all of the resiliency plans are going to be customized from one facility to another, it would be great to see what those trends are and experiences are, even from a manufacturer standpoint, Hayes, you know, or maybe you're a developer of a technology. I think those insights really help you nail down the, the needs, the real needs of an organization to, to, to be resilient. You know, everybody talks about, you know, if you've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital. Same thing, though, inside of a hospital, you've got obviously the corporate guys doing all the negotiating, the contracting, the warehousing, all that. But but your frontline workers, the people delivering care, it's a whole different ball game. And I think that's what they brought up is that it is different. You have to have different viewpoint. And so I really, really enjoyed their conversation and they did a good job. And so we do need more conversations about this. We need to look at this differently. And they they really kind of highlighted that. 
All right, everyone, thanks for listening to this episode of Power Supply. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Power Supply. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing on your favorite podcast app or by downloading the smartphone app on your iPhone or Android. Simply search for Power Supply in the App Store or Google Play. The best thing about downloading the smartphone app is that you can access bonus content for certain episodes and view episodes in certain categories, like articles on the go and vendor spotlights. Are you following us on LinkedIn or Facebook yet? If you are and you love an episode or post, then let your social network know about it. Like, comment, or share our posts along with your thoughts and keep the conversation going. If you have any topics or guests that you would like to recommend for a future episode, just send us an email to info at powersupplymedia.net. We look forward to hearing from you.